onward and upward. The tides, the most accessible part of the ocean is the intertidal. And humans have a long history with it because we are closely affected by the moon. Humans are, we lunatic fringe, and of course the tides are affected by the moon. So high tide is this great bulge of water that can be pulled by the moon's gravitational force when the moon is aligned with the earth to form a high tide. There's a less um, powerful gravitational force just for the Earth's core that gives another high tide, usually lesser on the other side. And then the position of the moon changes with the month when the sun, the Earth, and the moon are all aligned in a straight line. We have great high tides on one side of the Earth and low tides at the other. Similarly, if the moon is between the sun and the earth, we have great high tides because of the gravitational pull of both of these uh, planets. On the other hand, if the moon is offset, not aligned with the sun and the, and the earth, we get lesser tides. That bulge is much smaller. And these are called neap tides, these are called spring tides. So you look at tide charts and you look. For the when the moons look at the tide charts that will tell you when the moons and the suns are aligned and exactly how high the tides are at your locality. So NOAA keeps tide predictions that you can look up and for your locality and find a low tide. So if we're looking at the intertidal zone, we have to start with the terrestrial zone. And this is where the terrestrial seaside lichens live. So look at, here's flowering plants. We're, no, we're in the terrestrial zone, but these can be lichens that occur only in the ocean. So there's a, an ocean spray effect. There's something maritime that, it, that encourages these maritime lichens. But the, thing about the intertidal zone is that motion of the tides with the moon. Seaweeds have to endure being exposed to air and covered by water in this more or less regular progression through the celestial movements of the moon and the sun and the earth and everybody. So here's a picture at high tide. You can see that there are barnacles, there's bare rock, barnacles. Then you start to see a little bit of stuff growing. This is an urchin dominated place. You can't see the urchins because they're burrowed in, but they've eaten a lot of the seaweeds here, leaving only the crusts. But you can see that this habitat is a fully marine one, and this one is an aerial one. Life both above and below the water. So here's a little diagram to show Terrestrial zone, the splash zone, the upper intertidal, and you'll see these terms in books, the mid intertidal, the low intertidal, which is where we like to go, what like to plan when we go to the intertidal so we can get down as far as we can to the zero tide level and into the negative tides that are often covering land that's subtidal. So mean low, low water is a term for the zero tide level. So let's look at these zones from the point of view of biology. The superliteral or the splash zone has lots of crustose lichens, uh, crustose algae, litterine snails, those little tiny grain size snails that move way up into the top of the rocks. The upper intertidal zone is high, but it's quite rich. Turfy red seaweeds, rock weeds, which we'll look in detail, more crusts, because crusts are very good with being out of the water. Barnacles, mussels, animals that can close up and resist, hold water in their bodies and resist desiccation. 
The mid-intertidal zone is very rich in biomass. Lots of things grow there, reds, browns, greens, lots of invertebrates in the habitat created by those reds, browns, and greens. And then the low intertidal zone is really a glance into the subtidal because it's usually covered with water, except in those negative tides. Lots of lush reds, kelps, lots of invertebrates, and even fish in the low intertidal zone, sculpins, etc. So the subtidal zone is never uncovered. They're never exposed to air. And here you get the largest diversity of kelps, other browns and reds and greens, lots of fish, lots of invertebrates, all things that are not adapted to aerial life. And the intertidal zones change depending on if they're exposed to waves or sheltered. That wave action changes the form of seaweeds and it changes, it changes everything, whether things will live or die there. Postelsia, the palm, only grows in exposed places. It would be outcompeted in more sheltered places. The type of rock can be important. Hard rock holds better. Sandstone erodes. Whether there's pools and channels brings more species, more habitat diversity. So the intertidal is a very diverse place because of all these factors. From If we're moving from the high zone to the low zone, up in the upper places where there's lichen crusts, small snails, it's less crowded, very low profile plants, and it's physical factors that limit populations there. It's UV light, it's desiccation, drying out, it's um, wind, wind drying. These physical factors limit who can live there. You need special adaptations. But seaweeds, as you go a little bit lower and see the um, high tides coming up a little higher, they can hold moisture and pro provide habitat for others. So they're creating a lower zone up higher. As you go down further, things become much more crowded. There's larger sizes. And it's here that competition and herbivory, competition between seaweeds, among seaweeds, competition with seaweeds and invertebrates that are stuck to the rock. And of course, herbivory, they are more herbivores the lower you go because they're more mobile in that water that's there more frequently. So here, competition and herbivory are really important in defining who can live there. So let's go down to the ocean. Here, what I'm really talking about from high to low is called zonation. There are more or less zones from terrestrial at the top. You can see some barnacles going up these crevices where the waves, this is a fairly exposed place where the waves come and then the rock weeds and their friends, red algae, a great red algal zone with a few greens mixed in. And then down here would be where the kelp show up. You have to forgive me, this is the East Coast. I taught at Shoals Marine Lab for 25 years, two weeks in the summer. Everything is simpler there. There are fewer species and the zonation is very, very clear because they have these strong dominants, Ascophyllum nodosum, a couple species of Fucus, and then Mastocarpus zone, the red zone here. But you can see how it's um, layered by how far the water gets up and how far the waves move. California. Sometimes it's not as easy to see zonation in tumbled habitats that aren't nice cliffs like the one I just showed you. But notice this seaweed is only on the top of this rock. This seaweed is down lower. And as you go lower, it gets pinker and pinker. This is an urchin dominated area, but all of these are crusts that really don't like to be out of the water for long. So this is really part of the low intertidal here the mid intertidal, the muscle zone, the upper intertidal, and then the terrestrial zone. Although there are crests and uh, splash influenced creatures up here too. 
Uh, let's see. This is point arena. But you can see here the muscle zone is way on top of this rock. So muscles are in the mid zone. And if we were to able to climb over those muscles, we'd see more seaweeds. I'll show you a picture soon. But here's the mid intertidal. And then at the top of this rocks is the low mid intertidal. See these seaweeds here? And then we get into the lower intertidal where the kelps come in and a bunch of different reds, greens, browns, coralline seaweeds till we get all the way down to the low, virtually subtidal. This is a very low tide where the kelps are exposed, just the tops of them. These are also subtidal kelps, but they occur this far up in the intertidal. So they're considered also intertidal. Questions about zonation? Do you, do you get a feeling for what I'm talking about? How the water levels define these zones of life? So we don't have any questions in the chat, but if anyone would like to ask a question, just go ahead and raise your hand. Or I'll go on to the quiz. <laughs> At what phase of the moon is a good time to see seaweeds? Full moon or new moon? That's when the moon's lined up with the earth and the sun. Full moon and new moon. When are intertidal species most vulnerable? We had a lesson in this when the great heat wave happened. It's when the low tides are during the day. So the air is hot, the sun is hot, and that's when species are most likely to suffer. Many of them can regenerate very quickly. They can reabsorb water, but uh, many animals can't. They can't, they're not as um, wily as the weed. Why do intertidal species stay in the intertidal? Why are they intertidal instead of subtidal with all that water? It's a good refuge from herbivores who can't, the fish can't crawl up there. They can if the tide's in, but the tide's only in there for hours a day. And then having looked at those pictures of the intertidal, what is a limiting resource in the mid and lower intertidal particularly? What is at a uh, premium? Space, the final frontier. Finding a place to grow, to drop your spores and exist is extremely limited in the intertidal because it's wall to wall species, plants and animals. 